Fantastic to see a completely full house. Um, a very warm welcome this evening. Um, I'm Anna Taylor from the Food Foundation. And um, we're really delighted to be hosting this event tonight to be talking about household food insecurity. Um, and I'm welcoming you all really on behalf of the Food Foundation, but also Sustain and Simon's representing them today. Um, Rachel from the University of Oxford and the Food Research Collaboration. And I think Laurie is maybe here? From the, yes, brilliant, welcome. Um, so we've all been working together to convene this event. And um, we should say at the very beginning that this is part of the ESRC Festival of Science, who funded the uh, materials and so forth in the preparation of the event. So, um, thank you for coming. I think we're too big a group to be able to do kind of a round of introductions, but there will be lots of opportunity through the course of discussion to find out who's here and the kind of work that's, that everybody's doing. So, we're aiming to have lots of opportunity for interaction. Um, We've got um, three main objectives which we're aiming to achieve through, through this, this evening's event. Um, the first is to take stock of current activity around quantitative and qualitative research into food insecurity. Um, we want to see if we can start to think about developing a way forward towards national measurement of food insecurity. And then we want to see if we can get out of this a better connected sort of research and advocacy um, join up, if you like, because there's a lot going on in this space and I think this is an opportunity for us to make stronger connections with one another and collaborate going forward. Um, you've each got on your um, table things um, a form like this. Um, we'd really encourage you to fill it in because this is, this is really towards our third objective, which is strengthening um, links between everybody and we're starting to, we want to use this as a way of being able to start to create a bit of a network um, around who's doing what in this area. Um, there's no space for your name at the moment on the form, but please do put your name on here, otherwise <laughs> we won't know what to do with it. Um, and, uh, and then hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory to fill in. If you, there's somebody that you work with who's not here, or somebody you know who couldn't make it, but you know what they're doing, please fill in one there for them on their behalf and note that down too and we'll make sure that we capture that as well. Um, so, I think without going on any further, I think it's now fantastic to have um, Dr Rachel Lutstra here to tell us about measuring food insecurity, um, drawing on a huge amount of experience from Canada specifically. Um, so Rachel will present to us and then we'll have an opportunity for lots of plenary discussion. So over to you Rachel, thank you. Great. Um, is it okay if I talk without the mic? Yep. yep. Excellent. Thank you for a resounding yes. <laughs> um, so just today, the Trussell Trust, uh, the largest and only networked uh, group of food banks in the UK, published their mid-year statistics, once again highlighting that the numbers of people receiving food parcels from their mem member food banks across the country has risen. And this is in line with previous trends um, since 2010 when they started making their data public of a steady increase in the number of people being fed by food banks. Now these stats have caused public outcry as people have asked, how can it be that people do not have enough money for food in the UK? Of course, they've also caused controversy with a number of people highlighting the limitations of the data available, the data that's collected through the Trestle Trust Network. Some people saying it's, um, they're overestimating the problem of hunger. Some people saying it, they're not nearly capturing um, the number of people experiencing hunger in the UK. Um, but it's no doubt that this uh, data, the Trussell Trust data, has put uh, the question of hunger in the UK at the forefront of political debate. Um, and I think the fact that this room is so full reflects the fact that there's now so much interest in this question. How many people are experiencing food insecurity in the UK? How do they experience it? This said, I want to pause and highlight that this is not the first time that these questions have been asked and examined. There's a long history. I want to highlight um, Liz Dowler's book, The Welfare of Food, where she gives an excellent overview of just how long these kinds of conversations about food deprivation and how it's part of the measurement of poverty um, have been discussed. And then more recently, in over 2003 to 2005, a survey was conducted examining the problem of food insecurity amongst low-income households in the UK. 
Um, but since that time, there's been no national measurement of uh, food insecurity of hunger, and that's why we w wanted to have this event today, um, which continues in line with different um, conversations and workshops that we've um, been hosting on this topic uh, over the past year. Um, and really to, to drill down and focus on the question of how many people are hung hungry in the UK and how can we measure, move towards measurement of this problem. So in this presentation I want to um, go over um, what we've learned from other contexts where measurement of hunger has been done and has uh, been discussed, debated and taken forward. Highlight ways to measure um, uh, hunger and then also raise limitations about the measurement. Um, so I want to highlight the story from North America because it's re remarkably similar to the kinds of um, things that we've been seeing in the UK today. So one was that it was absolutely people lining up for food at food banks in the 1980s that pushed the question of what is hunger in high income countries, what is hunger in the United States to the forefront of political debate. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, similar questions were then asked in Canada as well. Um, but these, uh, the observation that people were lining up for food posed a problem because the way that people had typically thought of hunger was the picture of hunger that we see from less developed countries. Um, pictures of people wasting, of, of suffering severe um, and chronic malnutrition. And that was not the hunger that people were seeing in lines at food banks. So this raised a question, you know, what is hunger here? How can we define it? We can, we, the prevalence of malnutrition in, in the United States at this time was near um, zero in terms of, uh, sorry, of, of nutrition uh, deficiency. Um, so these biochemical measures were no longer useful um, in that context to measure um, as indicators of hunger. So um, I wanted to highlight this quote because there was a task force that was put together and it sounds very familiar to what we, we see debated and talked about in the UK today. So they were facing the same question. Um, and again, it was food bank use that had raised this question. So it was observed that there are no hard data available to estimate the extent of hunger directly. Those who argue that hunger is widespread and growing rely on indirect measures. We regret our inability to document the degree of hunger, for such <coughs> lack of definitive quantitative proof contributes to a climate in which policy discussions become unhelpfully heated and unsubstantiated assertions are then substituted for hard information. So sound familiar to the different kinds of quotes and debate that we see uh, in the media today, even in the House of Commons last week. Um, but uh, this interest um, was then taken forward. Uh, a series of qualitative studies um, were done to investigate you know, uh, low-income people's interaction with food, trying to come up with a construct, a definition of, of what hunger is in a high-income country context. Um, so here, studies, qualitative studies amongst families with children um, were conducted and I'm going to go through a number of themes that came out of these and since a number of studies have been done and it's remarkably remarkable how similar the themes are when you talk to low-income people the, the kinds of things that they talk about in terms of their, their food situations. Um, so one theme, uncertain access to food, um, seeing your cupboard becoming empty and not knowing how you're going to be able to fill it again and that feeling of panic that accompanies that. Um, not uh, thinking ahead and not being sure whether your food's going to last until the end of the month. Uh, then families talked about the shortage of food. Um, so from the second week of each month, there's so little food left in the fridge and in the cupboard, it's hard to make up a dish. So not being without food at all, but not being able to put together a proper meal. That's also captured in the next quote. For sure we're not starving to death, but we cannot eat so we can fill up. And then having to monitor how much your children are eating. Um, then people speak about the unsuitability of food and the monotony of the, the foods included in their diet. Being unable to follow dietary guidance, not being able to afford um, more expensive um, and uh, healthy foods. Um, being limited to only purchasing items on sale, and again, reflecting on the monotony of the diet, eating the same low-cost foods. And then lastly, people speak about the hunger they experience and having to go without. So in the hardest times, cutting the number of meals when I eat, 
I don't want to eat, or I, I don't eat what I want to eat. I have to make, I don't have enough to make a meal, so I just eat junk food. And then experiencing hunger, going to bed without having had enough food in one day. So these um, different uh, elements are brought together in what is typically referred to as the core components of food insecurity, recognizing that food insecurity is experienced within households differently amongst different members, that there is a range in severity of experiences, um, and that it's multidimensional. So there are social elements, there are psychological elements, there's quality and quantity in terms of how it affects the diet. Um, so I'm going to put up a couple of de definitions of food insecurity that emerged out of these qualitative work. They're, they're very similar, but they're both used and it's sometimes confusing. There's not one that's necessarily right, um, but these are uh, typically how people define food insecurity um, at the household level. So the inability to acquire or consume an adequate quality or sufficient quantity of food in socially acceptable ways or the uncertainty that one will be able to do so. Um, now, the USDA, the um, US government, took forward um, this research, uh, the, the qualitative um, findings, and put together um, a household food security survey module. They are very interested in this because they have public policies deliberately intended to prevent people from experiencing hunger. So they wanted to get this measure right. They put an incredible amount of resource into the development of this scale. Initially, over 40 items were tested. So out of those qualitative um, studies, different statements that people said, um, they put these into large national surveys and tested them. I'm not going to go into the details of survey development because it's very technical and beyond me, to be honest. Um, but what they did was test a number of these items and they boiled down uh, the number to make it manageable for a survey and they came up with 18 questions which describe increasingly severe household food circumstances. So it's a scale. Um, the questions all specify financial resource constraint, recognizing that people can go without food for a number of different reasons in a day, if they're too busy, if they don't have time. But here we're talking about people being unable to access food because they don't have enough money. Um, they also specify a specific time period, so any time in the past 12 months, and then recognizing that different people in the household, particularly adults and children, experiencing food insecurity in different ways, they have different scales for adults and children. Here it's important to note, though, that the operational definition that comes out of this measurement is now even, it's shrunk from the definition I showed on the previous slide. So gone is the social acceptability of the diet, and it's important to highlight here that the scale is specifically focusing on inadequate and insecure access to adequate food um, as kind of self-defined through qualitative and quantitative measures. Um, so you, on your handouts, you have the, the scales questions in the back. Um, I've also put them up on the slides here. I'm, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Um, but I just want to highlight um, a couple things about the US scale. Um, one is that the, the, the response patterns, uh, sorry, on the back here, um, the response patterns enable uh, a, a chronicity of experiences um, to, to be captured. So people are asked whether or not these statements are often true for them, sometimes true or never true. Also, the scale involves skip patterns. So if you're thinking about putting this questionnaire on a scale, don't be worried that there are 18 questions because if not one of these first three questions is answered, households are not then asked any of the subsequent questions. So in national surveys, in Canada, for example, um, no more than about 20% of the people filling out that survey in a national survey would go on to be asked the subsequent questions. Then there's also a number of questions that are conditional on the one before, again, to capture the chronicity of experiences over the past year. So here, someone's asked if they ever cut the size of the meals and then are asked how often did that happen. And again, that can give a measure then of, of the chronicity of the experiences. And it's important also for determining the level of severity of experience. And then at the um, final stage, again, if subsequent or previous questions had been answered, people are then asked the most severe experience here, have you gone a whole day without eating? And I just want to pause here on this question because I've recently been doing, um, giving, administering these que this questionnaire to people in food banks. And it, even um, just looking at any of these questions, it is devastating to hear someone tell you that they have to reduce the amount of food that they're eating because they don't have enough money for food and that they've been, experienced hunger 
and uh, because they didn't have enough money for food. I think sometimes I lose sight of that because um, I mostly work with secondary data. But what we're measuring here is extreme deprivation with respect to food. Um, then there's a number of questions that are asked uh, um, only of uh, households that have children. And again, I'm just going to flip the head. Um, since that scale was developed, the FAO has also been interested in, in building on that work and developing their, a, a scale that can be used across a number of different countries. So it very much reflects the same kind of um, things in the USDA scale. However, it had some different goals. So being able to use across, across different countries um, and also being simple to administer. So that scale is also on your handout and it includes eight questions um, and they're just answered by a simple yes, no. Um, but the same kind of elements are in this scale, um, but they don't include uh, questions specifically aimed at, at, uh, at children in the household. Um, but the same kind of properties are there, there's different severity of experiences, um, and that you can then scale people's experiences based on the number of times they affirm um, having those experiences. Um, so just this past year, the FAO put out their first report based on um, this measurement in over 142 countries. I don't expect you to read these prevalence estimates, um, but the UK fell towards the bottom half uh, of um, countries in the uh, EU in terms of food security. I'm just going to do one uh, highlight of that data because it, uh, it was based on the Gallup World Pool data, which is a questionnaire asked of 1,000 individuals in the UK, so not a very big survey. But it did, did give us a glimpse of just how much we're underestimating the problem of hunger in the UK if we rely on data from the Trussell Trust Network alone. So about 17 times more people um, experienced hunger based on this scale than who are captured in the Trussell Trust um, data. Um, so I've done a little bit of weighing the two options here. We're not necessarily coming out with saying recommending one over the other. Um, so, uh, but just some things again to highlight, which I've already mentioned. One is that the USDA scale has been used for a long time. And that's just because it's been around for a long time. The uh, FAO scale is new, um, but it's likely that it's going to be taken up um, to perhaps to measure the uh, sustainable development goals. It also has advantages because it's much simpler to use, um, but essentially both scales are capturing the same construct. I want to highlight a recent uh, review that was done because those aren't the only scales. To make things even more complicated, uh, there's a number of scales being developed aimed at um, asking children about their experience of food insecurity, and this is because it's been recognized that parents often underreport or don't know about their own children's experiences. Um, there's also um, items uh, to have only two questions asked. Again, that's just to shorten um, the amount of uh, questions in questionnaires, save some money. Um, but ideally, if you're including a food security measurement, the more detailed, the better. So if you have the resources to do it, the, mo the more detailed the measure you use, the less likelihood um, that you're going to underestimate the problem of food insecurity. You're going to be capturing more of those elements. Here I just want to briefly highlight that this scale does not capture all of the domains of food security that the FAO outlined. It's really only highlighting economic <coughs> access to food. So um, the USDA scale and the FAO scale do not specifically capture physical access to food. They also don't look at what food um, people have available to them. Um, I also want to point out this review again in Public Health Nutrition by Ashby. Um, because she, what they did here was highlight that there are no scales available to measure food availability uh, in, in local areas. So it's done at the national level, but not within um, local areas. Uh, the, scales, the, the food security scale also does not measure food utilization, so diversity and adequacy of the diet and how food is distributed within households. And then um, other than the USDA scale, which um, does give an indication of chronicity, um, the scales are not good at looking at stability outside of a 12-month period. Um, there are some other things that this household food insecurity scales have not measured. So um, and the, it really important to highlight here is that they don't um, capture social exclusion from social ways of eating. And um, I hope Rebecca O'Connell is here. Is she here? Not sure. Um, she was going to be here today. To she's from UCL, and she's specifically been focusing on doing qualitative research to, to examine the impact, uh, the social impact um, of, of food insecurity, and, and how people have been compromising um, their uh, uh, and, and excluded from participating in so in kind of societal norms and cultural food practices. 
And similarly, the scale doesn't measure the acceptability of the diet, so another element of food security. So how do people um, source their food and what are their feelings about their sources of food and are they able to follow their preferred diet? So there are some things that are not captured. Nonetheless, I would say that um, the focus on, again, food bank use uh, in this country, which has prompted the question of how many people are hungry, um, I would argue, first of all, that hunger, the problem of insecure access to food, is what drives people to use food banks. We know that from studies in other countries, and we know that from studies uh, happening and emerging, emerging from talking to people in food banks in the UK. So it's because people don't have sufficient access to food that they're using uh, food banks, but this raises the question about how many more people are experiencing this problem in the country. So last year we um, held a workshop, again on food security measurement, taking a consensus of the room amongst um, civil society groups and researchers, uh, do we need to measure this problem using one of these quantitative measures? And around the room the consensus was yes, so I don't know if we have time to count to hundred hungry here, but there's an online link we can give you where we um, outline the details of that workshop and came to the conclusion that for all of these reasons we need to um, move towards measuring and monitoring household food insecurity. Um, so here I'm going to turn it over to Anna to talk about or Robin. <laughs> um, so we're going to, yeah. yeah, or do you want me to? <laughs> no, uh, no, cha yes, chairing the next session. Yes, yes. absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were going to ask me so, to present something. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should have given a better segue. <laughs> no, no, so coming fine. from our workshop yeah, where yeah, we yeah. <laughs> determined the need to measure, that's going to be one of our things that's next up, yeah. is discussing how to move forward. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. That was a really fantastic sort of historical and technical perspective on um, the measurement challenge. So we're going to have half an hour now um, where we're going to discuss what we've heard. Um, this, and then it will be followed by half an hour where there will be an opportunity for many of you to tell us about what you're doing in this area. So hold back on that bit for the moment. This first half hour is really to hear any immediate reactions to what Rachel's presented. Um, we'd also like to see if, if there are any government officials here who want to comment, and I've specifically got some comments from DEFRA because at the last minute they were unable to come, so I'll deliver those, and that's all quite positive news. Um, and I think also we're really keen to draw out from this bit of a discussion experiences outside of food, perhaps in fuel poverty and child poverty, where we've got something to learn about how you get to the point of a successful national measure. Um, <coughs> so I think probably we'll start off with, and I should have also said at the start that we've got two hashtags that we're tweeting to today. One is End Hunger UK. Um, which is the hashtag for the national campaign on um, tackling food insecurity, and the, the other hashtag is the ESRC Festival. So please do tweet away if you'd like to. Um, so I think let's first of all start with um, reactions from policymakers, and perhaps I'll kick off with um, the feedback that we've received from DEFRA just this afternoon, who were um, disappointed not to be able to make it <coughs> to the last minute. So. Um, Dougald Struthen, who's in charge of food um, security in DEFRA, has asked, uh, asked us to communicate with you all um, that DEFRA is at the moment in the process of updating its food security, their food security assessment within the life of this parliament. This is a kind of evidence review that they do periodically and refresh um, periodically, and they're doing a kind of quite substantial refreshment under this parliament. There's a whole section, Chapter 5, which is looking at household food insecurity. The rest of the report is mostly about national level um, food insecurity, but there's a whole chapter on, food, on household food insecurity. And as part of that work, they're looking um, at the indicators which are used in that chapter um, to work out whether the existing indicators can be improved and what they know about data coverage and quality. Um, within that chapter. So there's a kind of active discussion going on within DEFRA at the moment about measurement of household food insecurity, which I think is really great to hear. Um, to take this work forward, DEFRA have noted that they will want to work closely with ONS. I'm, I know people from ONS were invited. I'm not sure if anyone's actually here, but they were looking forward to meeting you today if you are here. <laughs> so we'll, we'll make sure we can kind of facilitate that connection afterwards. Um, and then the other thing that Dougal wanted um, us to say was, of course, that this um, is a very timely issue. Um, 
there's full expectation that food prices um, are going to start to go up as a result of food commodity prices, oil prices and exchange rate shifts and that we can expect to see the monthly CPI start to shift after the post-referendum lag. Um, so they're very much seeing um, the food price issue as connected to the challenge of, of, of food insecurity and household food insecurity and how we measure it. So I think that's um, very positive news from, from DEFRA. Um, I know there are other officials in the room. I, Steve, I'm looking at you, but you might not want to say anything. But if you did want to say anything about what the FSA is doing, um, it would be great to hear. <laughs> yeah, <they're laughs> to hear that. I don't want to put you on the spot, though. No, if, no. Th okay. So there are uh, a couple of us here from the uh, Food Standards Agency, happy to, to talk to any of you through the meeting um, or, or afterwards. It comes down to us to, to the strategy we published a couple of years ago now, which um, went back to the statute that founded us back in 1999, uh, which gave us a statutory objective of protecting public health in relation to food, which is the stuff that we do that most people know about, but also consumers' other interests in relation to food. Uh, quite a woolly and open um, phrase. And so we, we did some deliberative work with consumers up and down the UK in the process of setting our strategy from 2015 and we came up with a definition of consumer interests in relation to food that resonated with consumers that went something like, see how much of it I can remember, um, that food is safe in what it says it is, that people have access to an affordable and nutritious diet and can make choices about the food they eat now and in the future. So a whole bundle of, of concepts that, that we would tend to, to tease apart in there about food safety and authenticity, affordability, security, sustainability nutritional quality. Um, but when we talk to consumers, they see this not as a set of individual issues, but as a, as a connected web of um, things, interests that they have and, and they experience. We recognise that the thing that, that, that we do, the space we um, <coughs> occupy that no one else across government does is around food is safe and what it says it is. So we're continuing to, to, to focus resources on on dealing with those issues, but for the rest of, of th those parts of interests of consumers, uh, where we don't lead on, on food security, DEFRA leads, and you've, you've read out what Dougald, um, Dougald says, we think we still have, have a role, a role to, to, to facilitate, to support, to convene, um, and it's with that in mind that um, back last month we convened uh, an evidence safari workshop with Policy Lab, uh, Anna was there and, and Liz Dow and, and, and many others, to try to, as, as a prelude really, to considering what we might do to work with others um, in this space. So I think we're, we come at it from the mindset that wanting to understand what the evidence is and the drive for more evidence and understanding how DEFRA as part of its fundamental review of, of food security is going to address um, evidence issues, but also to get down into the, if you like, real action planning with partner organisations. And I said, understanding what we can do to, to convene, to facilitate and support. Yeah, that was a really great event, so it's great to have seen that work kick off. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, before we move on, are there any other government departments here that wanted to, or, or, or not this is all local authorities, or others that might want to talk about um, <coughs> uh, any work that they've got going on in this space at the moment? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan Drozel Melbourne from the Greater London Authority. Um, just to sort of flag that this is an area I think as certainly as officers we're interested in <coughs> um, you know, how this could be measured. We, I think we appreciate the uh, inadequacy of the, the trust and trust figures. Um, the remainder the remain of commitments around food poverty that we're sort of interested in <coughs> further. Uh, and the Mayor gave the commitments of medical questions uh, last week before to um, to uh, probably the government on the introduction of the measure of household food insecurity. So um, interested in that and I guess also interested again at an officer level just you know how we could better understand the picture at the London level as well as the national level. Thanks Dan. So really fantastic to hear about the Mayor's um, recent commitment in this area and we'll circulate the YouTube clip of that perhaps in the follow-up to the, to the meeting. Um,
great. That's, that was hugely helpful. I think there's just one more point that I'd make if there's not anyone from ONS here. Is there anyone from ONS here? Um, so at the, at the end of the month, ONS are going to be publishing their recommended indicators for, the, for domestic measurement of the sustainable development goals. And as Rachel alluded to, um, the, the, one, of the, one of the goals is around um, ending hunger and malnutrition, and one of the indicators for measuring that, sorry, I should say one of the top, get muddled up with the goals, targets and indicators, but anyway, one of the indicators <laughs> is, um, is this measure, the FAO recommended measure. Um, and that's, uh, it, I think the ex the, uh, we're expecting at the moment because of the, the sort of tiering of that indicator at the international level that that will be one that will be recommended by ONS for national measurement within the UK. So that will also have, it's a sort of another sort of way into the challenge, I guess, in terms of the question of UK reporting. So uh, there'll be more on that from ONS at the end of the month. Um, so I think then let's, let's move on and hear a little bit now about experiences outside of food specifically. Um, we have um, William here from, the, from Citizens Advice, is it right? Um, who, who's got loads of experience on fuel poverty and it'd be really great to hear a little bit about that and how it relates to this. Well, I'm reading some of the uh, uh, material that was circulated and uh, that note of the seminar, but it did strike me there are a lot of parallels um, in terms of how uh, fuel poverty has been conceptualised and uh, thinking about uh, measuring some of the, some of the uh, problems and uh, issues that have arisen. Uh, I mean, fuel poverty... <laughs> I mean, yeah, the concept of fuel poverty has been around for quite a long time, and I think uh, it was it probably first became common parlance in 91, 96. It was, uh, um, it was incorporated within uh, uh, housing condition surveys, uh, and uh, we've had this sort of similar debates about what it's then is fuel poverty distinct from general poverty. Uh, and how might we measure it. Um, something that struck me as a parallel was uh, within the concept of fuel poverty is this idea of required spend. And it's actually quite difficult one because it is sort of based on the technical assessment of what's required to improve a home, uh, to, to uh, bring a home up to certain temperature standards. But what's quite helpful for us is that we have WHO uh, recommendations around minimum temperatures, uh, healthy temperature standards within the home. Um, and so we've always had quite a strong focus on you know, the health, uh, you know, the links between fuel poverty and ill health. Um, and uh, um, although I would urge that we don't just see fuel poverty as about heating, it is about people's need for other energy. And, uh, and that's where it gets a bit more complicated in that uh, um, requirements for uh, heating uh, can be based on this technical survey, and it's a fairly, you know, if you like, more, almost an absolutist sort of uh, uh, standard. Um, whereas people's requirements for other energy needs is very, you could say, socially determined. Uh, you know, for instance, most people, we, we take showers pretty much every day. That wasn't the case, you know, say 30 years ago or whatever. We need power for uh, appliances um, much more than we used to. Um, but I did wonder, with those temperature standards, whether there might be a parallel with, in terms of you know, what nutrition standards or something like that, and making that sort of case for why that's important for health. Um, as people are probably aware, the way that fuel poverty was operationalised was around, uh, was uh, for a long time, this notion of 10% uh, uh, of required spend, um, of people needing to spend 10% of their income on fuel. Uh, in England, that was, uh, uh, they moved away from that, and we have something called the low income, high cost uh, definition of fuel poverty. Um, and it again struck me that both of those have problems, and they both have sort of, uh, in a sense, reduced the scope. 
of, uh, of uh, how we understand <coughs> poverty. And it's quite interesting, but very recently people started to look at things like social relationships within feudal homes and how that, uh, uh, how poverty affects that. But, um, and you can see with the 10% definition, people we, they sometimes refer to subjective indicators of fuel poverty, which is basically people reporting that they're having problems affording their bills, they're having uh, problems keeping their home normal, um, and, uh, um, and what's the objective indicator, which would be, say, the 10%, and quite big variations. So, for instance, social housing tenants, generally social housing is seen as you know, having very good energy efficiency standards, but there's an awful lot of social housing tenants that say they have severe problems affording fuel. Um, and, uh, um, and that proportion is much higher than would be suggested by the objective indicator. Um, and you do get weird sort of consequences from that 10% thing. So, for instance, for a householder that's receiving, that, for instance, had some measure, some way of reducing their fuel cost by, uh, by you know, £10, uh, uh, that would seem to have about 10 times the impact of somebody uh, of that household receiving a £10 increase in income. And that was just because of that ratio and so on. And so, you know, and that, whereas for the household itself, it wouldn't have made any difference at all. On the other hand, things like the low income, high cost indicator, that's had big problems in terms of, well, for my, I think one of the biggest issues, you want an indicator is actually able to tell you that uh, uh, policies that you might want to uh, introduce are going to have an impact. We now have an indicator which basically virtually doesn't change, it's static. Um, and uh, um, you know, to my mind that's not a very helpful indicator. And I think that has uh, had reflected in, in the policy debate. We don't hear anything now, about, we don't hear about changes in numbers of fuel poverty and whereas it did used to actually, you know, there would be more attention. And I think <coughs> political attention to the issue has, potential, I think, has reduced as a result of that change. Um, and I guess at the end, of the, the last thing was, you know, when we, a lot of the discussions around definitions of fuel poverty and, uh, um, you know, how, how it might be defined and uh, how we measure it and so on, have, uh, uh, have had half a mind of what are the solutions. Um, and there has, to be honest, been very much a pragmatic uh, uh, focus on energy efficiency, although I think it's important that you know, interventions around prices and income are also uh, made. But in a sense, energy efficiency, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fairly concrete thing to understand. You can work out what's required, uh, how much it costs, you know, and you can set those minimum standards. And certainly I think the uh, notion of minimum standards has been very important quite recently in sort of trying to get political support for, you know, more action on it. And so it just, it seemed to me, it, it both, the, the, how you measure, how you define does have implications for, you know, the sorts of solutions you might be looking for in terms of uh, uh, policy. Um, and I just want to find, I think uh, we have our parallel with uh, food banks, number of food banks, um, which is equally problematic in fuel poverty, and that's excess winter deaths. Um, and, uh, it's, and but it's really politically important. It's a thing that always grabs attention and so on. And as campaigners, we always focus on it and so on. But it is actually quite a difficult, problematic concept, you know, from a health perspective and from public health and so on. And you know, there are uh, uh, you can have a uh, you can often have a very cold October or whatever, and uh, um, that would have been reflected in the excess winter deaths. There's all sorts of oddities about that as an indicator, but it is, does, it is a very powerful yeah. thing that you highlight. So I don't know if that's Thank all you. you wanted. Thank you, really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and, and particularly your point at the start about, um, about, well, how do you actually quantify how much money is needed? And quite a lot of that work has actually been done around what is the minimum amount that it requires to afford a healthy diet using the consensual, have I got the term right? Consensual um, methodology. Loughborough University has done quite a lot of that work. So that work is out there, but obviously it's not really then translated into being sort of officially recognised as a, as a figure, which is where you got to, obviously, with the, the fuel poverty work. Anyway, let's open it up. I don't know whether there are others who would like to comment on that, whether there's anyone from the child poverty perspective that would particularly like to comment on that. Sit your hand up now if you are here. Otherwise, we'll just open it up more broadly to any reactions to the comments so far or to Rachel's presentation. Lucy. And if you 
just tell us who you are as well? That would be brilliant. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Lucy. I'm from Liverpool Food People. We're a food partnership up in, in Liverpool. Um, I just wanted to comment, um, following up on, on the comments about the CAB. Our group in Liverpool also involves somebody from the CAB, and they have also conducted some research for us with people who are experiencing food poverty. And one of the things that's come up, particularly for them, is access to food, as in having to get buses, to be able to get to a shop, to get to a store. The fact that in Liverpool our buses have been deregulated, so it's a flat fare, whether you're going one stop or, or 15, can add masses to your shopping bill. The fact that if you want to get it delivered for free from a supermarket, you've got to spend a certain amount. And I think we need to also consider those kind of barriers that that, that happened within within people's food experiences as much as anything else. The fact that a lot of things have also been sort of centralised, so there's one really big supermarket to go to and all the little shops locally have disappeared is also an issue. So we brought that up with our planning. Uh, departments to sort of see if there's any opportunity for them to reduce down costs to put a greengrocers or fresh food shops in and is there any way in which maybe business rates can be reduced, something that's going to encourage a bit more of a, a local kind of shopping experience that's easier for people in those, in those situations. <coughs> Thanks, Lucy, that's great. And I think Rachel flagged that up as being one of the limitations of the method. Did you, yeah. yeah, that's right. So the scale doesn't I, I guess insofar as people can't get to a food shop, it, like as far as that's a financial reason why people would then say no, they they you know uh, experience skipping meals, those those types of indicators, then it's captured. But it, I guess it depends whether how they would answer those questions. Um, so yeah, specific, there's no specific measure about you know can you not afford to get to a food shop uh, in, in the indicator. Um, although I would say that that would kind of when we think about um, how this could look in a questionnaire, if, that, if there's other questions about transportation asked, then we could identify that as one of the ter determinants of food insecurity, and it would point inter intervention in that direction. I was also thinking, someone might want to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think TfL has quite a good indicator for London about a local area's kind of connectivity to public transport. But for what I'm aware, there's not similar ones in other areas of the UK. So it's similar. I don't know. That's just my fault for that. Okay. Um, gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Mark Fishburne. I'm chair of <coughs> Middlesbrough Food Partnership and Middlesbrough Reform and Water Partnership. Really pleased to hear uh, about the learning with the fuel poverty agenda. There's an awful lot of um, stress can be avoided, I think, from learning from that and what's happened. Um, I think the point I'll make, though, is that even though we've had an excellent fuel poverty indicator for uh, quite some time now, um, that alone doesn't mean anything's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be uh, thinking that because we get an indicator, something's going to change. We still spend 1.3 billion every winter in the NHS treating people with cold, damp related illnesses, and excess the deaths are still going up. So having an indicator doesn't necessarily mean anything's going to change, and it's that relationship with policy makers that's going to make a difference. Yeah, really, really important point. So measurement can only get us so far. And I think that's where this, the work that, that, that those of us that have convened this meeting and others are doing to try and stimulate the discussion on measurement sits within the broader campaign um, for End Hunger UK, which has got a much wider group of actors and is focused on policy solutions to preventing food insecurity. So it's very much part of that broader discussion. We're focused today on the measurement question, but we're, that, that definitely the wider agenda is, is firmly there as well. So thanks for raising that, though. It's really important. Um, anybody else like to comment at this point, or any questions for Rachel um, on the presentation that she made? from Neighbourly, we connect companies with charities and community projects in particular in this area, uh, food surplus food distribution, mainly with Marks and Spencer's stores at the moment. Um, the thing that strikes me from this, firstly, great, I'm really glad we're doing it, because having got relatively recently into this area, there is a real paucity of data. In fact, um, with the Food Standards Agency and uh, Food Foundation, we work to try and map 
where the food charities we work with were, what they were doing, what the output was. And again, an area we know very little about. It strikes me there's a real opportunity in terms of mapping that we could do, working with ONS data about where the issues lie, what kind of population groups we're looking at, uh, homelessness obviously, across this area, the decisions, the actually terrible decisions that families have to make between switching their heating on or feeding their family, which we know from the child poverty agenda and kids are planted as well as really brought out this area over decades. Um, but what we don't know enough about is where the supply is. And I don't know if there are any retailers in this room, but I speak to a lot of retailers. In fact, I was talking to the co-op recently who was saying, we want to do something about this, but we don't know the data. We don't know where there are those gaps. We don't know where we should be putting low price lines in. We don't know how we can support the issue of transport, which I think is another major issue as well. So being able to map the core um, statistical data on population deprivation and those different subpopulations, plus the food insecurity data, which this could really reveal, plus actually, and it's there, just need to aggregate it, where the retailers are, where those great organisations like Company Shop are, where the many organisations in this room are actually trying to <coughs> solve this issue, we could have a dynamic model that could look at where the need is and start to have a much more predictive approach to addressing food insecurity. Maybe that's a bit down the line, but that strikes me as a huge opportunity here. Um, and just one last point, we see a lot of this is driven by the behaviour of retailers and in reducing food waste to begin with, uh, looking at alternative ways to get that uh, supply of food out with, we're not chucking this enormous amount of food in the bin. And again, we do know there's waste statistics and there's a big push to get transparency of retail data on food waste and any one major retailer currently publishes this. So it strikes me as another push to get retailers to reveal um, and be transparent about food waste uh, that's happening in the supply chain as well. So there's a, there's a big statistical model that could come up and actually be, I think, quite groundbreaking in this area. Thanks, Steve. Um, does anybody want to pick up on that? Um, Quick supplement, I argue the microphone that the food retailers have been using new demographics to go to target the high spending areas. So, totally will flip over because it's a lot of things. So, uh, find the exact opposite of what we've been avoiding for about three, three decades. Yeah. Interesting flip Very over. Very interesting, yeah, absolutely. And good to hear that the girl thinks about it as well. Right, uh, Liz. I was hoping you were going to say something. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bell. Um, there's a lot of points to make, but I'm not going to make them. I want to pick up on just the last couple of ones. Um, I, think, I think there was a lot of really exciting, important work that could be done, as you just said, linking different data sets. And I don't know anybody is here from Good Food Oxford. I live in Oxford. Well, you know, it's a really rich city, lots of rich people. Well, it's not, it's a city that's got a lot of quite hard up people really struggling, etc., etc. And Good Food Oxford, one of the many sort of collaborative groups, about a year ago um, commissioned two small bits of work, um, which I don't have enough money for. And one of them, I think, as far as I can tell, was done by a group of students who I thought naively were food students, I think they were chemists actually, who just went up and did it with their own batch. Uh, they mapped how far people had to travel to in order to get a reasonable basket of food. Uh, um, when I say reasonable, I mean, they tried to look at health and they tried to look at price and they rapidly this from two estates. Sorry, I can set that up. They rapidly discovered, well, everybody discovers who tries to do this, how difficult it is to get um, a basket which is sufficient and appropriate for different groups and all the rest of it. I agree with you that lots of people have tried this. It's very good work out there, but it's a really tough call. I tend to feel that the food fuel, okay, fuel poverty parallels are very good and there's a lot to learn. My sense is that fuel is easier to get a standard for than good nutrition. And I've been trying to do it for many years. Anyway, these students said, uh, this is my point, oh, they said it's really difficult to do all the things. And actually, what I came up with in the end was a banana and how much bananas cost. I said, you can patent this. The banana index would be great. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Spain. Uh, but actually, what they did was to map how far you had to travel to get the cheap bananas. Okay, 
this issue of actually food, which we're not talking about, which we lose sight of in Oxford. And that's quite revealing, and how much we have spent on buses. Someone else did something very similar, not from the ones this time, they were looking actually at how much easier it was to get busy drinks than to get fresh and veg from Barton and from Little More. <coughs> These are very familiar stories, so the third point I wanted to make was 20 years ago, having done the initial work on low income food in London, where there were many quote unquote food deserts, some of them right opposite the other side, a bit on the face, the other side of the river from where we're sitting. Um, there was a dearth of shops that people could get to where they could buy sufficient food to have then. I don't know if that's true now, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's changed that much. Um, but um, at that time, I moved on with others to look at how far people should have to travel and, and by what means to get to decent shops. And many of the things that I couldn't hear who it was on the other side said about retailers were true then. And probably, the retail stories changed a bit in 20 years, but not hugely. And I wanted to say that, that, firstly, in those days, people were feeding others with charitable food, but that wasn't in the headlines. What was obvious then was there were food cooperatives, and lots of people were up with setting up buying cooperatives for food and veg. Same thing, that people volunteering, using their time, absolutely fantastic, except it's not really acceptable in a rich country that poor people have to spend their time feeding their neighbours um, when rich people can just throw money at the problem if they're in the shops and they can't afford to come. I don't think that's changed much, except they don't seem to be the buying properties. I keep asking about who's doing that. Um, also, at the same time, there was a lot of um, reports produced by the social exclusion units, different government from now, but that, I don't think that matters. And one of those reports was, uh, I think it was Policy Action Team 13, it must still exist somewhere in an archive, which was about access to shops. It was a damn good report. So it won't be entirely the same issues now, but there was a lot in it, and it's been to be more than that. Um, uh, was that. But it was a very good report about the problematics of small shops and large shops and areas where there's a, a lot of people living who don't have enough money to spend, so shops and other services have withdrawn. Of course, there are many people who are food insecure who are living right opposite large supermarkets, and they don't go into them not because they, it's too far to go, but because they don't want to wear clothes. And as somebody said to me 20 years ago, I've been followed by the store detective if I went to that supermarket. So it isn't just a matter of, of distance, although I completely agree with Lucy and Liverpool that for many people it is, which demonstrates that if you've got a good set of indicators, you then map it with other indicators, because household food insecurity is not the same for all households. The experience and the reasons for it and what's driving it varies a lot. And we need to be much smarter in understanding it, as people are about fuel poverty. Thank you, hugely useful comments. Thank you so much. And Flora, yeah. And then we'll move on to the next bit. Thank you. I'm Flora Douglas from Aberdeen University. <coughs> I'm interested in the input from DEFA and, and the fact that there's interest there that the ONS are reviewing the, the, the indicator in relation to uh, the sustainable development goals. That's right. Is there any interest from the Department of Health officials? And I ask this because in Scotland, where I'm based and working on strategic research programmes which government has commissioned, there is interest and um, discussions taking place at the moment about um, introducing a major in the Scottish Health Survey, which I see is a very positive step uh, on the basis of knowing the data that's come out from Canadian research, where, it's been, where the, that data is collected in the Canadian Health Survey in Canada, and we're going to do epidemiological work that's showing these associations with negative <coughs> health outcomes and increased healthcare costs. I'm taking the gentleman's point in the corner about you know, measurement is only one part of it, but in that context it's been possible to, to, to do the advocacy work uh, around you know, the, you know, things that people really have recognised, you know, people falling ill unnecessarily or experiencing a burden of health unnecessarily because of the experience of food insecurity. So I just wonder if, if there was a similar interest in, in that part of the um, I The only 
Well, I've been having a few conversations with Public Health England um, about it, um, and I know that um, <coughs> they're, thinking, they're thinking about it, basically. Um, <coughs> but I, I think it's not got any further than that, is my understanding from the conversations so far. But I think the point about the, the benefits of nesting this within a health survey are quite strong mm -hmm. in terms of being able to then look at broader associations and so forth. And... Um, so I think you know there's there's scope for further conversation there. Really. Um, yeah, Lucy, you want to go? Uh, sorry, Lucy. Yeah. It was just to say that in Liverpool, public health has taken quite a strong role on this, and they have actually um, they have actually been supporting financially um, school holiday um, programs to support children. So they have actually been paying um, for food to be provided at children's centres to feed children during school holidays who would be missing out on the free school lunches because they're seeing already changes in the spectrum around children and their attention at school, etc. And it's one of the long-term things that our strategy is looking at, that this is something that is going to impact in 10, 15 years' time on children's life chances and where that's going to go. Yeah, and I think another point just to make briefly on that connection with health is the, the job of work that we all have to do, I think, which is to be clear on um, you know, the huge socioeconomic differences that we have in obesity levels among children and how that set of data, which is arguably a higher political priority at the moment than, than food insecurity, but how we weave that challenge together, you know, where how food insecurity links to obesity and cheap food being the least healthy and that hot you know, getting really clear on those connections and this is all part of the same problem around dietary inequality and poverty. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's there's some some work to do there in terms of getting that this, that, that those issues more connected um, in the policy narrative. Anyway, let's move on now. Um, we've now got um, a session which time is here. Thanks. So just quickly, because we want to make the best use of the time that we've got left, we're going to be doing uh, three things, I guess. Obviously, you're welcome to talk to each other in a natural way, but we've also got five people who <laughs> offered to be uh, centre points for some strategic networking. So if I could ask you just to, I'll introduce you, if you could just stand and say literally one or two sentences about what you do to uh, entice people. So first of all, we've got Jackie McDowell from NHS Scotland. Hi, I'm um, the support we've done with the community partners, community-led research into food security and security. Thank you. And then we've got um, Sinead Curie. And Sinead, if you could come and stand, we'll make some space here because you're just in the doorway there, so just for health and safety. Then we've got Flora uh, Douglas from University of Aberdeen. Yeah, um, I'll actually introduce myself. I'm a principal investigator in the Scottish Government's strategic research programme, which is commissioned on a five year basis, based at the Royal Institute of Nutrition and Health, and I am a lead researcher looking at food insecurity in terms of developing a measure or supporting the development of measure for the use in the Scottish context, but also looking at the qualitative experience um, associated in, in, in the same programme. Thank you. Then we've got Rosie Oglesby, who's very recently joined Feeling Britain as their new director. Hi. So Feeling Britain is a charity which came out of the all-party parliamentary group on hunger, and we're looking at supporting a range of local pilots and programmes on food poverty. So really interested to look at how those might be able to contribute to drawing our national data from the new poverty level. Thank you. And lastly, Dr. Martin uh, Barrens from the University of Warwick. Hello there. So uh, working with two local authorities, uh, building decision support systems uh, for policy choice around um, food security, household food security in their patch. And uh, there are entrances they've been working with us, Coventry, who's also a pilot, we're on the steering group. Um, uh, and Warwickshire have introduced a single question onto their regular household surveys because they felt concerned that they hadn't got any good data. 
and we're looking to map between the household survey data and the trustal data in those areas. Thank you all very much. And then while that is on